So I met Charles in, in 1973, actually, when we were with, a, with um, we had a visit from the graduate students at Ghent University who visited IDS, the Institute of Development Studies in Sussex. And Charles was there together with Rafi Kapinski, who were the two sort of uh, upcoming scholars there at IDS. And he was giving a talk on technology transfer and issues about um, technology adjustment, uh, primarily second-hand machinery and all kinds of issues. This was a very popular debate, and it was the times of choice of techniques and other things, etc. And Charles was a very traditional neoclassical economist, as a matter of fact, and he explained how in development you needed to adjust the technologies to transform them before, according to traditional economic theory, primarily the book of Amartya Sen of 1966 on the choice of technique. So this was the story he, he gave us. And I, um, I came back and I was sort of, you know, wondering whether this was uh, what I wanted to do. And I was interested, of course, very much in some of the ideas. And I wrote my master's thesis on the issue of technology transfer in, at Ghent University in 73. After one of the other, then I, I went back to Sussex in, at IDS to apply for a PhD, and I, I got a British Council scholarship, and so I started to do a PhD with Charles Cooper as my promoter, as my supervisor. And so the, since that moment, I had basically been pursuing Charles Cooper, because he then, when I arrived at IDS to do my PhD, I first was refused at IDS because my topic was insufficiently focused on development issues, and it was too economic, so I was kicked out of uh, ideas, and I was moved to the economics department at Sussex University. But Charles kept, was still my promoter, but he left from ideas to Sproul. And um, so I did my PhD uh, with Charles, I can, and went back into Belgium, and then I moved back to um, ideas in uh, 78, 79 actually, and a couple of weeks after I got there, uh, Mrs. Thatcher was elected, and she declared IDS a quango, a quasi-autonomous, non-governmental organization, and basically it meant that you were without a job. So I had left my tenured position at, in Antwerp University, moved to uh, IDS as a core fellow, and I was told after exactly one week, because I, I arrived on April 1st, and Thatcher was elected, I think, a couple of days later. And this was the first initiative she took that there was actually no money to fund myself. This is a very good learning experience, I must say, in terms of how you start to become quickly aware about the market to attract or to find research funding. And it's, it's actually Keith Pavitt who helped me, and I then moved to Spru to find funding and to start to do some research on various research projects, etc. So this is a little bit my... Charles then left IDS and went to the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, and then in 87, uh, 85, was asked to do this feasibility study on the UNU Institute, which was UNU Intech, to be set up, not in The Hague, because wider had just been set up, but in Maastricht. And the person who achieved to get this done was, of course, Will Albeda, whom you just saw in the previous pictures of, of um, I quickly skipped this here, but this was the board, as we had the first advisory board of, um, one of the first advisory boards of UNU Intech uh, with Lin Soo Kim, who also passed away since then, Eugene Skolnikov, a Dutch uh, member from Philips, uh, who was there. And so we, uh, it moved on, and finally, uh, the creation of UNU Intech, the feasibility of UNU Intech was finalized in 87. I had moved then from Sussex to Maastricht in 85. And again, I then worked together with Charles on the feasibility study of UNU Intec. It appeared that UNU Intec would be not feasible to be set up because the governor of the, well, this is confidential, there is no, well, the then governor of the province, uh, Shen Kremers, had promised the funding to the other institute, which was set up, ECPDM, which you find on the Onze Lieve plan here in Maastricht. There's another institute, which is called the European Centre on Policy Development Management, which was set up, and basically the Ministry of Development Affairs had no more funding for UNU Intech. So the UNU Intech initiative would not be developed. And um, so Charles told me, well, you better try for yourself, because this is not working out. 
I will go back to Oxford. So I then, with the help of Albeda, there on the picture, decided to set up another institute, and that was called Merit. And that was successful, basically because we, we of course, were not a UN, U institute. We also didn't ask the kind of money which U and U Intech was requiring in terms of an endowment. And so the Institute Merit started in 88 uh, with the IFIAS. Some of you might remember the IFIAS book. The, the, I think some of you have been involved, uh, at least in some of that underlying work, which was um, organized actually in 87 already, before Merit was set up. It was then published in 88 and was a sort of very quick start for uh, Merit. Merit had funding for five years. So this was the difference, of course, with you in Intech. And in '92, we organized uh, um, a big event, basically, to say now, from now on, uh, the name is to remember that, from now on, we must go on our own and do it ourselves. And, of course, in '92 we had a big, I think, one of the successful conferences, with, amongst others. Uh, if you look at it now, Paul Romer was there, Ken Arrow was there. Um, Many of the new growth, uh, Brian Arthur was there, of course, Paul David, Nate Rosenberg, Dick Nelson, many others. I think Jacques, you might also have been there in 92. Um, so we had a, a, a good conference with lots of uh, people, but it was primarily the idea that this was the final moment of merit, and from now on we would just try to find funding and live and proceed on our own. So anyway, I'm talking far too much about all this. This was the uh, creation of... Um, here you can see the, the picture, which I think is the same one on the same building, but I was wrong. It's not 1988. That, that The reason why we had that picture was because my nephew drew the picture. At the, you, know, you probably remember this, Bart, and some of you too, that once uh, in the old building we had in the Tongersweg, Tongersstraat rather, uh, I asked my nephew to draw a billboard at the back, uh, basically revolting uh, against the uh, modernization of the city of Maastricht and in particular the whole ceramic area which was built in the years in those years and so my nephew on the weekend did all this uh, and of course I had to go to a conference on the evening and I disappeared and uh, nobody knew where this picture had come from and it was a bit of a uh, I had a bit of problems but not too many problems about and the picture is still there surprisingly after 30, well, this must be 30 years, the, the, that picture is still there, which is quite incredible. My nephew, you know, there were all kind of, uh, the, this was really <coughs> the oldest part of the building, and there were all kind of nails in that building. Some of you might still remember that building, because there had been, whatever, had grown on flowers and other things. And he painted on the whole thing, so anybody who has to paint on this, good luck, because they will have to take out each of these nails one by one. So. He enjoyed doing this, but anyway, this was uh, this is the past, and this was great fun. So, uh, in 2005, I moved, uh, or we, thanks to, um, well, thanks to Hans van Ginkel in the first instance, we integrated the two institutes, Merit and UNU Intech. And I know Charles passed away in 2005, and I know I've heard from his wife and from other people who were with him that he was very happy with the idea that the two institutes would integrate. So what Bart said is that this integration of these two institutes has really been something that Charles also himself would have liked. Why well, I put here the picture of the dog is the dog of, of Jacqueline, which of course was the dog of, some of you might remember, this was uh, the secretary of Charles Cooper, Jacqueline van Kesten, who always had a dog with her. And every time you entered the office, uh, and you had to go through the secretary's door, but to come into the office, you had this little dog who was jumping on you, etc. So this is my first achievement that I could get rid of the dog. <laughs> it was a very difficult, I must say, one of the most painstaking and pain, painful events on to try to convince her that this was not my problem, but her problem. That it was a dog which would otherwise cry the whole day at home because there was nobody to look after, etc. But this was uh, successful. And so this was the picture, of course, of merit. You might do the same prize here, Shiana, about who is whom. And I don't know whether anybody recognizes yeah. somebody there in the middle. Yeah. Yes, but apart from somebody who is now with merit, with you and you merit. Hmm? No, 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 no. Who's now? 
Adrian van Zond. Exactly. You might see Adrian van Zond, the guy there in the middle. That's Adrian. So, this is uh, another picture. This was the Intech picture. This was Mary. This was Intech. And you might also recognize somebody in the middle there. Uh, but all the ladies have gone, but he's still with us, as you know. Mark Vleugels. And this was, of course, the way it grew, etc. And you can see the people there, and it's always nice to see with these pictures. You see a newcomer there, here, on this side here. <laughs> and uh, so it all grew, etc. Anyway, I, this was just some personal um, memory, etc. We have had Amilcar Herrera first and then Charles Cooper lectures, and Rafi, of course, was one of the first to give the Charles Cooper lecture. Um, Shiama, of course, was the other person, uh, as she just mentioned. Um, she gave the, the lecture back in 2008, 10 years ago. So it's nice to be able to follow in this line of uh, people who have given these lectures here, from Carlotta Perez, Nate Rosenberg, Eugene Skolnikov, to Dick Nelson, uh, and many others. So let me come really what I would like to talk about in, in this uh, Cooper Memorial Lecture. And as Bart said, I, you know, these lectures are very much in terms of what you would like to focus as a vision, rather, in terms of where we are in our field and how um, that field evolves and what are the main challenges of this field. And I will, be tra I will try to be pretty radical. We have a field in which the assumption is that in terms of development, whether you look at the north or the south, there is a convergence between these three ideas that you can have smart growth, very much based on science, technology, and innovation. You have sustainable growth, which is very much based on the need to move into a sustainable development path. And you have inclusive growth, which is primarily aimed at that the distribution of the gains of technology are equally distributed, or at least that everybody benefits from it. And my claim will be that these three concepts, as much as they are used in a common framework, as for instance in the European Union, you know, the European Commission has each time the Europe 2020 strategy, which is smart, sustainable, inclusive growth. It then has the 2030 strategy, which is built on the same thing. My claim will be that these three goals are increasingly contradictory to each other. And that this is one of the most fundamental issues, and that if you go back to some of the literature, such as the one of Charles Cooper, the literature on adjusted technologies and on the, the various issues about technological choice, you find lots of the ideas which are particularly relevant today in terms of trying to answer these internal contradictions. So, if I first look at, for instance, the, um, the way you know, you could say that we looked at science, technology, and innovation, and, and you would say, you know, going back to the old idea of the residual or the solo resi residual discussion, you could say to some extent that an intrinsic characteristic of this technology factor has been to obtain economic growth, economic development, which can indefinitely expand. In the previous, all the previous growth models, there were always decreasing returns to capital, to labor, to materials, but that with respect to adding the technology variable, one had the possibility to indefinitely expand the economic system. So it really categorizes capitalism as an, an opportunity for capitalism. As you see, it's also reflected very much in literature today as this possibility to, to expand and to expand indefinitely because you continuously have new technologies adding to the value of your economic system and hence there is no limit in terms of the expansion of that economic system. And this is very much what you observe, and I quote here um, Jeremy Grantham, because he was is one of the sort of typical big investors, huh? the, the ones who he has this enormous uh, investment company, one of the richest in the world, and, and basically put it, uh, as I quote him here, capitalism by ignoring finite resources and by neglecting the long-term well-being of the planet and its potentially crucial biodiversity threatens our existence. So you have a first sort of impression of this expansion, how far can this expansion go, and to what extent is there, is science and technology and innovation responsible for that continuous expansion? If you look at the... Um, 
the way this is translated in policymaking, you see this across the world. And across the world, I, I've put here as title, Science, Technology and Innovation Funding. Bart and I have been part of this commission uh, with Hugo on, on the impact of science on, and technology on economic growth. Now, if you look at it, the line is there continuously increase the rate of technical change. And fund, fund, fund. And the whole debate is it's certainly coming from a university. We are the stakeholders in that same argument, and we will claim today, even I was yesterday, uh, I'm a member of this committee advising the Minister on Education and Science, and this is all about how do we fund more research in terms of universities, for instance, etc. So the whole line is really to have a continuous growth in science and technology funding, to have a rate of technical change, in other words, the supply side as central, how can I increase further that rate of technical change, whereas to some extent that rate of technical change hides the fact that when we talk about research and development, we talk, of course, in the old Freeman tradition about the Frascati manual discussions, definitions, <coughs> of industrial R&D. Anthony and many others have been involved in many of the discussions of broadening this to innovation, but we still talk about a very traditional definition of industrial R&D in research labs um, with the typical sort of professional research lab framework which is in which you find all the national stakeholders represented, which are all claiming more funding, universities, academics, research technology organizations, the large incumbent industrial firms, consultancy firms, they're all omnipresent. And you see this very much, of course, at the European level in Brussels, where you see that all these stakeholders are represented and are, find it, are extremely happy and, because they succeeded today in getting Horizon Europe as a 100 billion research program for the next seven years in the multi-financial annual framework proposals of the Commission. And if you look at the figures, at, this is even the figures simply at the OECD level, you see that you know, despite the economic crash, which has been relatively limited in terms of R&D funding, if you compare it to the literature we had in 2007, 2008, when one was really warning for a dramatic decline in R&D funding, it has been a marginal decline. And you can see that in current funding, of course, only, you see that you continuously increase both public and private, and if you put it at the country level, this is, a, this is the first time, thanks to this picture, to this room here, that I can show a picture which everybody can see, with all the colors and all the names. Whenever you propose this in, a, in any kind of presentation, nobody can actually follow it. It's a, but this is more or less all the information on research and development in one picture. On the horizontal axis, you have the R&D spent as, say, by the public sector, so GERD funded from non-business sources percent of GDP, so basically all the public funding of R&D. On the vertical axis, you have the R&D human capital intensity, the numbers of researchers per million inhabitant, and then the size of the bullets is basically the private R&D intensity, so how much firms are spending on R&D. And as you move away and you spend more publicly, you see that countries have... Of course, there's a positive correlation with your human capital R&D intensity. The more scientists and engineers you have, the more you can spend publicly or vice versa. And you see that also you attract much more private R&D when you have a lot of public research funding and when you have a lot of researchers in your country. So these, these bullets, the size of the bulls grow as they become bigger, but the USA figure is the, it's not the absolute figure, it's the R&D intensity in the private sector. So, what this shows is that if you look at the global level in terms of research and development, you see all these countries there which are also starting to expand quite a large amount on research and development. So the R&D at the global level is much growing much, much more rapidly than the picture which I showed a minute ago from Nature on the OECD side. And it is really, it is in this sense impressive that you have this continuous growth in science, technology, innovation, industrial R&D. And so the point about this is, and I will focus very much on the consumption side and the product innovation side behind STI, is that since the Second World War, you had a dramatic rise, of course, in energy use and CO2 emissions and other emissions 
which are basically linked to this intrinsic drive to expand your market continuously with new products and to move the OECD world, as well as today the emerging economies world, to US consumption patterns, whether this is from in terms of individual households and their uh, typically household appliances, whether it is in terms of motor cars, whether it is in terms of the whole habit and the whole structure of most of our economies, have moved in that direction. And if you combine this with the dramatic growth in advertising, you see that you have an international spreading of consumerism, which has basically blossomed along the lines of new innovation products, replacing each time the existing capital stock of the previous generation of old-fashioned consumer goods. And so consumer variety as the engine of economic growth. And that will be, of course, is, is one of my main claims when I, I presented the Maria Hoda lecture was basically that this process at the consumption level is not a process of creative destruction as we have it in Schumpeterian terms of to say that we have structural change where a couple of incumbents suffer, disappear possibly, and we have new sectors emerging and a lot of new firms emerging in the typical Schumpeterian fashion of this kind of notion of creative destruction. No, we have here a process of destructive creation. We have that a few firms enter, start with producing new goods, basically to destroy the capital stocks of the existing previous generation of goods. And this process is typically a process which you see very much reflected in the whole set of, of uh, sectors. And let me give you a couple of examples. This is the, the notion, and, and this was, of course, the, the, the line with the Guinness is good for you line, which is that we have in our community primarily at the level of goods and at the level of organizations always had this view, and this still is very common in the literature, as innovation is good for you. I don't think there is a single paper where, which will highlight the impact of a negative impact of innovation. You find even the word innovation is even becoming so generally used that you talk about new innovative products, whatever processes, which have by definition a positive meaning to it because they are an improvement. And the point, of course, is that this is not at all the case necessarily. You can indeed show exactly as opposed to the Schumpeterian process of creative destruction that you can indeed have destructive creation. That is what I basically want to go back a little bit to the examples I gave in the, in the Yahoda lecture uh, and afterwards which I further elaborate and were three uh, specific cases. And the first case is really the case of where you move into ecologically unsustainable development. You basically have this continuous renewal of goods and there is a, a very nice model of Emilio Calvana, Calvano, sorry, who has developed this further, and where he shows that it's in the logic, it's to some extent, remember in the new growth models of uh, Adion and of Roma, we always had this element of this stealing effect. And that is that you could actually have this, this uh, you had product differentiation as the engine of economic growth. In terms of that engine of economic growth, and there, were, there are a few of those new growth economists who have highlighted this, you could have a negative impact. It could be that you have a couple of firms who attract the monopoly profits to such an extent of the new goods that basically they generate the growth and as such survive and become, will of course be opposed by the next generation of innovators. But that as a model, and this is what Calvano does in this model, which is, is a very nice model, that is that every firm will not compete on prices, but they will compete on innovation. And they will do so by trying to make, as soon as possible, the existing stock of goods obsolete. And they can do so by saying, you have an iPhone number so much, or you have an additional feature in your goods, which is that feature which you would like to have. And in that system, you enter typically what I would call destructive creation. You destroy capital stock in terms of consumer goods which exist, which satisfy needs and wants, but you add to it a particular additional need, which is felt by typically the additional feature you have added to the good. And this, this whole model comes out, of course, out of the marketing literature, the advertising literature, where, of course, you look at the high income levels, or basically even more the top performance, professional 
say, professional sport players, professional music players, <coughs> professional whatever area, and where the whole idea of the advertising campaign is to convince the average consumer that he needs those professional qualifications. So you will sit in a car and you will have audio of four boxes, etc., with incredible uh, fine-tuning, etc., and quality of sound, which you barely can hear, except the whole neighborhood can hear it when you put open the windows, etc., and which will be pretty poor for your ears, etc. So you have continuously additions to goods, which are basically not in relationship to any real need, but which are basically elements of competition on innovation to try to introduce continuously a new good. And the competition model is basically an innovation competition model. Because that is the model which, and Calvano shows this very nicely in his model, that this is really the engine of profitability for firms and has become the engine of profitability for firms and the reason why they will spend a lot of money on research and development. Because they will continuously enhance, improve and come up with new products. Second example which I want to talk about and which this slide was actually meant for is that financial innovations are a typical example of destructive creation innovations. Eh? This, say, whatever, credit default swaps, any kind of financial innovation which were introduced primarily in the, after the internet eh? uh, in that period, in the period up to 2007 and 8, were models whereby you exploit cer certain knots, certain elements in the financial system and you put the risks of the system on the external markets, etc. Remember, uh, Stiglitz has written a lot about this. But this is typically well accepted in the literature as being innovation which has a destructive creation, nature and potential in the financial sector. So financial innovations, many of those fit in perfectly in that same framework of systems by which firms compete, a couple compete, a couple will succeed, and finally reap the monopoly profits for themselves at the cost of the rest of society. I've added to these other examples of destructive creation. The last one is the addict addictive impact of social media, but I won't talk about this so much because this is the same line to some extent of attention economics, which you could follow in the same line of saying this is typically an example of destructive creation. So what is, and I, I refer to, to the literature if you're interested, this is to some extent analyzed in the, in the, um, in the report of this Yahoda lecture in a new and new merit uh, working paper some time ago. Why, let me come back to this uh, Emilio Calvano model, because the extreme case is, of course, in that model is planned obsolescence. And you know there is a lot of legal, there have been lots of legal debates, that is that at a certain moment you could see that firms, to enhance the likelihood of the shift to a next generation of product, will introduce planned obsolescence. So that is that they can, they know that at a certain moment the battery of your whatever uh, mo mobile will be, will, will run, to, will no longer function for whatever reason, not a physical reason, but simply because it's been programmed to stop working. And that kind of planned obsolescence has, of course, entered many areas, particularly in the telecom area, because where the generation of new goods, etc., is the essence of the profitability of the telecom uh, producers, uh, etc. So this is, again, something where um, you, know, you, you, you typically have an, an innovation process which is going hand in hand with value creation, but the value itself is becoming increasingly ill-defined and based on new uh, goods which are, in terms of the additions, what they, what they add. I have already talked about the Calvano model, but I, I invite anybody who's interested to look at this model, which is a very nice uh, model which, which um, illustrates what's, what's going on in terms of the way innovation influences economic growth and has become the engine of economic growth. Paul David has an even more fantastic one. You add, of course, advertising. He refers to this as the Emil de Marco syndrome, in memory of the famous instance of the uncontrollable obsessive accumulation of more and more pairs of women's shoes, another richly documented fetish object. This is from her, I think, Howard, this comes from her uh, bedroom uh, of Imelda. Poor, poor Imelda. Anyway, the line is that all this kind of um, cons conspicuous innovation 
uh, growth model is basically a model which has been uh, the engine behind, I would argue, what we have witnessed over the Second World War in terms of economic growth, and more generally, what we witness in terms of the catching up processes which we've witnessed elsewhere. And a typical example of this is, I, I refer you to Paul Krugman's model of 1989, uh, if you, some of you might remember, this North-South model, and in which he has technology as the only variable in terms of explaining the trade flows. And then he explains how, ultimately, in that model, it will be, as he put it, it's uh, like in analogy with Alice and the Red Queen, the North must keep running to stay in the same place. And this was part of his critique, precisely, of technological competitiveness, what you could translate today as a notion of smart growth, is that to keep your higher welfare, to keep your higher wages, to keep your competitiveness, the North will have to continuously to invest and to grow and to invest more in research and development and the firms will have to invest more coming up continuously with new uh, goods, new consumer goods. The question then is, of course, at the global level, what does this imply for the South? Which other direction to pursue for the South than just to imitate the North? And so the, the, the upside of, to some extent, of Paul Krugman would be that if the North must keep running to stay in the same place, the South must keep running to catch up. And you will never catch up. And you will be in a phase in which you continuously increase your catching up, our research and development, your technology transfer, etc., in a model in which ultimately you will never catch up. But at the global level, of course, you enter into a complete dramatic increase in the ecological footprint of humanity. And ultimately, in the rapid movement towards the Anthropocene. Remember, it was Paul, uh, Paul not Paul Thomas, but Paul... Um, Nee, no, no, Paul Krautsen, who came here, got his um, um, uh, on Dr. Honoris Krause, Nobel Prize in Chemistry, who invented the term Anthropocene mm -hmm. as the Holocene. The Anthropocene is the next phase in humanity in which the Earth is now dependent on human behavior uh, and is, is, is evolving. And Anthropocene requires, of course, that you have other views on research and development than the STI, which I have described in terms of its catching up features and in terms of its catching up, it's continuously running in the same, in the same place. So this is obvious in terms of this picture. This is a picture which is from 2007. It's very funny. I find it's very funny that this picture is then turned upside down when you look at the picture of 2014. And it gives you exactly the same problem. That is that if you put the Human Development Index, so the poorest countries are on the left, and you put here the ecological footprint on the right, you can see that everybody has to come in here. So it has to reduce the ecological footprint, particularly on the countries on the north. I mean, you can put it, if you prefer, I can put the picture back on the, on the top. So you have all to move into that top, and you see the, the, the problems for, because the countries are named here for the United States, for the, uh, for the United Arab Emirates, Australia, etc. how tremendously the research will have to f bring you back into that ecological uh, corner, and for the poor countries, or the South in general, how you have to not follow a direction, which is the catching up direction, which is the direction which would go in this line. And that is the drama of the whole model of smart growth and the contradiction with sustainability at the global level. So, what brings us this to us? Well, my first claim, therefore, is that smart innovation at consumer-based growth and sustainable green growth are in contradiction with each other. And you see this, for instance, very much in the case of carbon emission accounting, which I know some of you are uh, also interested in and involved in. You see this, for instance, that the, the if you look, uh, and you see that in terms of carbon accounting, private consumption by households account for something like 64% of global emissions. So it is not the public sector, it is not the investment um, 
by the, 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 the it's not government consumption expenditure, it is not the construction equipment infrastructure, etc. Et they only represent one third of your CO2 emissions. The six two thirds of the emissions of global emissions are directly related to household consumption. And they're directly related to the picture I just showed you in terms of the wide diversity, in terms of level of, as you put it here, human development. And so, what then has to be done? Well, first you have to get back STI first, in the first instance, to improvements in productivity. To get it away from this tendency, certainly at the private firm level, to try continuously to replace existing products and to add continuously variables in terms of your uh, additional consumption needs and focus much more on eco-productivity, reducing energy intensity and emission intensities of, pro of production and trying to reduce, of course, the upward surge in emissions. The second thing is, of course, that, and this is a quite fundamental question, particularly for the North, dare we to act on consumption? And I quoted here from the book which René Kemp gave me from Ian Gouch, cutting private demand and ending our commitment to economic growth, reducing the sphere of private consumption would reduce opportunities to compare one's consumption with other and richer groups, which is one of the drivers towards high consumption. And that's, of course, the essence of, create, of destructive creation, is that you continuously use the comparison in your consumption paths with each other to highlight the need for a new additional good which adds some elements of characteristics of a good which another person doesn't have, and which is the basis of this continuously consumerism, etc. So, in this sense, the issue is, as uh, uh, Ian, Ian Gerg puts it, is that you, you, you see, this is one of the most, for me, is one of the most fundamental issues in terms of addressing economic systems, is that can you claim can you intervene in consumer choices? To proclaim, and let me quote here, to proclaim respect for consumer choices as the taken for granted foundation of policy is to respect the current factors and forces shaping preferences as either optimal or unchangeable. And my claim is, of course, that they are neither optimal, and in terms of changeable, this is an open discussion. But can we, for instance, I've discussed this at some stage, I think, with Jack before, can one regulate advertising? Can you introduce some personal carbon rationing in particular areas? These are to some extent the issues which I think are becoming fundamental in the current environment of unsustainable development. The other point, the other statement, I, or the other element I would like to, to point to is that for me also sustainability and sustainable development and <coughs> inclusive development are also in contradiction with each other. And you see this very clearly of course in terms of the typical needed, the most needed, what you call the necessities, energy, water, transport, have often a higher carbon emission than many of those luxury goods I talked about. It is the luxury good issues, it's primarily the accumulation, the continuous replacement, the fact that you continuously are pushed towards new varieties of goods. But if you, and this is where you see, of course, what we've witnessed a couple of days ago, the Les Gilets Jaunes, is typically because one has ignored the inclusive part or the inclusion part with, of course, the sustainability issues. And what you get is that if you simply increase the prices to take into account emissions, you're going to have major distributional issues, as you see today in the revolt in France and in Wallonia, despite the fact that both in both countries the petrol prices are much lower than they are, for instance, in the Netherlands. <coughs> and the fact is that, of course, that this inequality and the distribution issues is here not just in terms of income, it is also in terms of urban and rural areas, etc., where, of course, the need for transport, etc., is, is, is much different. So what you get is here, again, a fundamental challenge, that is that you will have to address first the so-called eco-social issues. So this can be going in the areas of housing, eco-social policies, in terms of co a comprehensive green deal, in terms of house retrofitting, uh, social energy tariffs, all kinds of measures, which you will have to do before you start 
to increase the prices, which is of course essential if you want to move into your sustainability box as put there. So the, the, the inequality issues and the, the difference between poor and rich in societies, don't forget that tax finance, social consumption, such as health services, social care, education, is inherently redistributive. Huh? Allocation according to need, risk of citizenship, not market demand. And it automatically serves redistributive social goals. Public services are 76% of post-tax income of the poorest group and 14% of the richest groups. So you, you really have there, again, the same fundamental contradiction between trying to achieve sustainable and inclusive growth. So what can we do? And this will be my, my last part, which is really to say, well, what is the, what is the solution to all this? I think that, that, and this is very much a debate we have in Europe at the moment, but I think it's a debate which should be carried out at a much more global level. It's the really the, the line that is that at the moment we have a discussion in the European Commission to take the sustainable development goals, as, as, as we all work on those, as trying to derive the missions for each of those sustainable development goals. And Mariana Masukato and many others have been instrumental in this, and myself on an expert group for the European Com Commission on, on this issue, on the economic impact of, social, of um, research with respect to these missions. The point is, though, that these missions are becoming then very specific and, and highlight certain features, whereas I think that at the moment you need really a broader directional vision. You need to, to indicate that you shouldn't focus so much on your rate, but you really should move in the direction of a direction. Which direction? Well, in my view, the direction which leads you to sustainability. That is the most urgent, is to how do I get my STI conglomerate of industrial research, but also innovation, design, etc., in that direction. And I think then, and this is where I, I would like to make the link also to Charles Cooper, this is the link that I think that the first alternative and overacting directional framework for SDI should be found in biomimicry. Is to go back into what can we learn in terms of the way nature has responded each time to the challenges. You can do this at the level <coughs> of inventions, you can do this at the level of research, you can do this at the level of design, you can do it at the level of innovation, but if you only look at Google, I mean, they only put, Howard, put a couple of pictures here, but you can see in many of these areas that biomimicry has become a major element of trying to see how I design this kind of green technology direction. And this green technology, of course, at the global level, which means openness, uh, which means international exchanges, which means um, that you develop <coughs> further uh, these things. And that is, of course, where I think there is a link with Charles Cooper, is that in the 80s and even in the 70s, this was, of course, an idea whereby you had, you took into account choice of techniques in terms of the differences between countries in your technologies. And this was essential, and you see it very much reflected still today in uh, much of the work of Kahalat, Anil Gupta, and others on frugal innovations, base of the pyramid innovations, etc., in which you go back to some of the essential features which are in line with the local environment, and you see to what extent the innovation can satisfy there these most important needs. It is a little bit, if I if I may go back, it's the, I, it's not on this um, slide here. It's when, uh, if if I read some of the the notes of, of for instance, Umtat on technology transfer, etc., and on the way in which uh, these technologies should, the, the current vision on, on technology, it's all about harnessing frontier technologies. It's all in the old tradition of how I get the top technologies transferred and how I use these technologies in terms of whatever uh, competitiveness or other rules, etc., I have within, the, within the, the specific developing countries. Whereas I would argue very strongly that you should really design a complete new directional framework for global research and global STI activities based primarily on these two, on these two elements, biomimicry on the one hand, and on the other hand, some of those notions of frugal innovations, etc. I have given, I mean, I, I've written uh, five, six years ago a lot on these things when, when uh, with Anil Gupta, it said we had a couple of meetings on these frugal innovations and on some of the ideas there. I will not repeat those here. 
Let me come to my, some of my uh, conclusions. I think there is, uh, and you see this very much in some, uh, in, with philosophers and others, you see a sort of temptation to prophecy in global policy advice which fuels writings on collapsology. I don't know if you've seen uh, some of the books, etc. here. There's the book by uh, uh, Pablo Servigne and Raphael Stevens, How Everything Might Collapse. You find, I would even argue, that uh, Bruno Latour's Fas à Gaia goes in a similar direction. And this is the direction where you have philosophers, you take on the position as we. And they describe the view of we. And the collapse is predetermined and is actually given. It is something where you can, there is very little one could do. It's a closed view. And um, the question is, of course, how do we as scientists and researchers respond to this? My view is that on this, really, you, you have to develop a multiplicity of counter-anthropocenes, views on the future of in which society could go, whereby you really propose various forms, and I mean the, the most radical forms I have given here in terms that you would dare to address the choice of consumption, that you would dare to address taxing advertising, that you would dare to address some of the issues in terms of giving um, ecological footprint rights to some and not to others. But you will have to be much more radical in terms of your advice and go in a direction which can only be in a positive direction. I don't think it's the role of scientists at the moment to describe uh, or to announce the inevitability of catastrophe or to, to predict and to have the line of prediction in terms of how you go to collapse of your whole system. And I think for me, this is really what, what I would say is the fundamental challenge for you and your merits. That this, in this framework is that you have to become much more radical. You know, as, as, an, as an academic think tank, you will have to be uh, radical in terms of going out of the security of your disciplinary excellence, your peer reviews, your various other things. You will have to... You know, you will have to go out of the window dressing, which you see all over the place. I was talking with Sudi, and I, I, it's fortunately not on this slide. I had the window dressing of businesses, uh, who are the sustainability index championing, and, and number one, uh, a nearby large company claims it's number one in the sustainability index, whereas it is itself on a location which is, the, I think, is 25% of the total CO2 emissions in the Netherlands is coming from that location. Um, you have um, the European Commission with its ECTS, or sorry, its ETS, its uh, emission trading system. You have universities, our green impact, and the competition between teams to eat more vegan and other things. Now, good luck with these, all these fantastic ideas, but that is not the issue. The issue is a much more that you need to move to a much more radical uh, transition. And, to give you some examples, I had one here on the, on, the, on the written part of the slide, and this was the, I can't resist in this, this was Benoit Curé, a member of the executive board of the European Central Bank, who was also discovering, of course, climate change, and, was, and I, let me quote him. I will argue that climate change can be expected to affect monetary policy one way or the other, that this, if left unchecked, it may further complicate the correct identification of shocks relevant for the medium-term inflation outlook. It may increase the likelihood of extreme events and hence erode central banks' conventional policy space more often, and it may raise the number of occasions on which central banks face a trade-off, forcing them to prioritize stable prices over output. In the more desirable scenario in which humankind rises to the climate change challenge, the implications for monetary policy should be equally far-reaching in particular, in particular, if the associated shift in the energy mix changes relative prices to an extent that risks destabilizing medium-term inflation expectations. In other words, you have these whole areas which each interpret the climate change within their pretty narrow framework, which in this case is how do I preserve price stability? And how does the university preserve whatever? So in each of these cases, my claim would be, let's be more radical as a 
think tank or as a research institute. And just a couple of examples, uh, the EU emissions trading seems, sis, system, sorry, which you all know in terms of a cap, a cap and trade principle, uh, which we're talking about how prices would have risen and would enter into a level where, which is needed, 190 sort of dollar per ton of CO2, and <coughs> look at what the prices have done so far, and we have finally now a little peak, uh, but we have about 900 million emission rights which have been taken out of the market and which will be put back on the market in, I think, 1st of January 19, 2019. So all this is too late, too little, not sufficiently uh, radical in terms of providing solutions to the problem. Taxing aviation as the last one, a recent report again on technology and environment whereby uh, what, what most people think this is impossible, well, no, you can certainly use synthetic fuels for aircraft um, uh, transport and aviation produced by green electricity and which would, could lead you to carbon neutral energy to, to your whole fleet. The problem is only that, again, you cannot do this at current prices for kerosene. And so you need at least 60% increase in prices with respect to kerosene. So in all these cases, the problem is primarily that you're stuck in low pricing for a whole set of activities which needed, which would be dramatically need to be taxed. So let me conclude, and this is where <laughs> I would say uh, this is what we should do. We should stop traveling for research purposes. And I'm not saying this to all the guys who came here from Parmet. Jacques came with the TGV, which is on nuclear uh, and, uh, electricity. So I, I, but, but, you know, why is it that we, as a research community, we've had MOOCs in education, we, we have different methods in terms of addressing uh, students from all over the world, but when we talk about research, we have not developed all this kind of... You see politicians, Mélenchon in France, who had this kind of virtual representation where he was at three places at the same time. Now, this is typically something we as researchers should be doing. Because it's an area where we are, <laughs> we are at the research level with respect to information and communication technologies. We could be the ones who develop this. We could have at UNU Merit an office where you have these. So Bart should not have to go December 5th to Tokyo, but he could sit there and not just be visual, but he could as if he was sitting in Tokyo itself, physically next to the rector. Um, and he would not feel it, but he would, it would be exactly as if he were there. So why is it that we... At the research level, we like research networking, we like research conferences, but we also like the cheap travel, the fact that travel is serving us, that we get food, we can watch movies, we can work for once, not being interrupted by anybody over long hours, etc. So there are all these factors which really are probably influencing that we love to travel so much. So my call upon all of you is to say, let's just do at least our contribution and focus on the substitution and start to travel no longer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>